on doing it. All right. Do you guys remember March 16th of 2020? Right? That was the day that our government said, we're shutting down. We recommend no groups larger than 10 meeting together. And you remember how everything just stopped, right? Restaurants, malls, parks, offices, schools, you know, just all vacant. All, like, at, at, on just drop of a hat, and now we have to find brand new rhythms. Do you remember how your life changed, right? All the, all the, you, had, you had to now figure out how to work from home. Or if, or if you couldn't work from home, now you had to figure out what sort of gear you were going to put on to go into work. Um, or you lost your job. You know, your kids were trying to attend school while, while sitting in your living room, you know, on the same devices that they play video games on all day long. Uh, we, we had to coordinate our grocery runs. What time were you going to go to the store? Which one of you was going to do the grocery runs? We had to figure out how we were going to get enough toilet paper. You remember that? We had to strategize, you know, like what days that does the, do the new rolls come? Um, I remember like being at, at Walmart and there were none on the shelf, but there was like a box, like a crates, like the, like Walmart literally had crates like out in the aisles because it couldn't stock things fast enough. And, and <laughs> me, and a, me and a couple of people were like <laughs> tearing at the plastic to stick our hands in the box and get the toilet paper. But I got it, you know. You remember all that? Lives completely changed. Us as a church, we shut down. We didn't have in-person services. We bought a camera. And we started putting on live stream services for about three months there. Thankfully, thankfully, um, that's in the past. That's a memory. I don't know. Maybe it's too close for us to, to reminisce quite yet. But eventually, you know, the, the restrictions eased up. We were able to come, you know, uh, uh, we were able to get back to kind of life in gatherings. Um, have you guys been to like large gatherings of over 100 people, like a sporting event or a concert? And, and it kind of feels like, Ah, we're doing it again. Like, we're back. You know, it feels like a win. You know, uh, we went to a, a concert, and the, it was the musician's first concert after COVID, and they, and they made sure they, they let us know, because it, it felt like it was a significant event for all of us to get back out there, you know, and, and be a part of, of the, this, like, hope. Like, like we aren't going to be shut in, locked down forever. Part, part of that's because us as humans, we connect. That, yeah, that's who we are, even if we're introverted. You know, we need this, this human connection. Um, our, our lives are probably forever changed. Um, I, I don't know if, if we're ever going to go back, um, but, but we've got new rhythms now, and we've got new uh, habits and structures that we've placed in our lives that we're trying to navigate now. Uh, church, same thing, same thing. we still got the camera. Hello to everyone watching us online. Um, but, but across the nation, attendance is down, like way down, significantly down. Not everyone that valued going to church or gathering together on a Sunday before the lockdown still values it now, for, for whatever reason, and, and there's, there's plenty of reason. Uh, but what we're going to answer, or what we're, the question we're going to ask is, is it necessary to gather together as a church? Is it, is it necessary to gather, or can we just go online? Uh, this is a relatively uh, new question with the invention of the internet that, that really enables us to play every single thing that happens live streamed to whatever, wherever you have internet, right? Whether it's your phone, your, your living room, TV, your computer screen. Uh, you can uh, get up right out of bed whenever you want. You don't have to get the kids already. You don't have to make breakfast. Um, you don't have to get there early or stay late to serve. Um, you can just participate uh, just from your living room. If, the, if you don't like the song, you can fast forward through it. If, um, if you don't like what the pastor's saying, you can turn them off, right? Turn them on mute, you know, and wait till the good part comes on that you want. Uh, you don't have to deal with people, right? Like if um, you don't want that person to come talk to you, well, great. If you stay home, then you can still participate in church. And so the question is, do we have to? Is it necessary for us to gather? We're going through this series where we're calling it House Rules, and we're talking about what are the statements, the house rules that define who we are as a church, as beyond church. Uh, the one we're talking about today, oh, let's make sure I got this turned on, is we gather together. That's a statement that says, we are going to gather together uh, in person uh, for us on Sunday mornings. This doesn't answer the question, is it necessary? Uh, but, but, but it's at least a statement. Here's where we stand, and we're going to explore why is it necessary or why do we feel we gather together? What's the purpose of it? Um, many churches, like I said, are, are going through this exact same question where now there's an online audience. There's people that only stay online and are a part of the church. And so you try to figure out, well, how do we engage them through you know, text messages, emails, uh, prayer requests? How do we make sure that they're a part of us um, if they aren't physically present? Um, 
And, and there's no real good answers. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not where we can say, oh, well, they aren't a part of church or they're a separate church or they're a part of our church. But the question that's lingering in all of our minds, we've asked it ourselves, right? Is it necessary to attend? Is it necessary to actually show up and gather together? We're going to look at, at a source that was written long before COVID was around, uh, long before the internet existed. Um, but we're going to look at the Old Testament. There are several stories, I picked out three for this morning, where all of Israel, all of God's people gathered together for, for what I think is uh, not relatively clear why they all had to gather together. And so as we explore these passages, it can help provide us with some insight into why do we gather together? What, what's, the, what's the purpose or what's the reason for us coming on Sunday mornings and gathering together? I've, I'm going to do portions of the three passages all at once and we'll throw it up on the scripture and then we'll go back and look closer to it. So hold on to your Bible or get out your app where you can navigate quickly. Uh, the first one that we're going to go to is Exodus chapter 19. I'm just going to read the first 11 verses. Now, you probably don't know Exodus chapter 19, but you probably know Exodus chapter 20. So Exodus chapter 20 is the Ten Commandments. This is where God speaks the famous Ten Commandments. I want to start the chapter before because the story really starts in chapter 19. Well, I mean, the whole... It's all part of a story. But that, that little section, that, you know, you wouldn't have a scenery change from 19 to 20. So in Exodus chapter 19, this is right before we hear the Ten Commandments. Verse 1. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought this answer back to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Uh, I'm going to stop right there. We'll pick it back up. But what this is setting the scene is that Moses has a special relationship with the Lord. The Lord called him out to lead his people uh, out from Egypt and to become the Israelites, his people in the desert. Uh, God has spoken with Moses before, but now God is saying, I want to speak to the people. I want to show up to the people, gather them together. We, we're saying, holy, you are holy, God. Because he's holy, he says, consecrate them. Have them all take a bath. They need to be clean, and they will come up to the mountain. If you read further, it talks about they can't touch the mountain. We're going to let the mountain be God's space. They can't be there. We, we're going to have to have this separation. But I want to come before everyone. So gather everyone there. Uh, that's the first example that we're going to explore what it looks like. The next one happens hundreds of years later, after the Israelites were brought into this promised land. They became that kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Uh, there were a line of kings uh, that, that were representatives of God, and they were charged with leading God's people to follow his righteousness. One of those kings is a guy named Jehoshaphat, and we're going to read a story about him. Now, this is Second Chronicles 20, and I don't think you probably have any recollection of what Second Chronicles 20 has to say, unlike Exodus 20. That's the Ten Commandments, remember? All right, here we go. Um, 2 Chronicles 20, I'll let, you, I'll let you flip there a little bit. I just want to read the first four verses to set the scene of why the people are gathering. You'll see that they're gathering before God again, but for a very different reason. All right, this is 2 Chronicles 20, 1 through 4. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Mayunites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom. From the other side of the Dead Sea, it is already in Hazazan Tamar, that is in Gedi. Alarmed, 
Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. And so here you have another example. This is uh, when they're in danger. They're about to be invaded by a foreign army, and all of Judah comes together before the Lord to seek him. Uh, We're going to come back to that one as well, but I want to give you the last story uh, so we can keep all three of these in our mind as examples of God's people gathering together. Uh, This is later on in the history uh, of of God's people. So eventually, a foreign army comes in, invades, and they are exiled, and they spend 70 years in a foreign country before they are let, uh, released to go back. And so a small remnant, a small group of God's people comes back to Jerusalem, which is completely burned down, destroyed, and they begin rebuilding the city, rebuilding the walls, rebuilding the temple. And then once they've kind of finished the work and they're all settled in, it says they all gather together. This is Nehemiah chapter 8. I probably should have told you that at the beginning so that you could be looking for it right now. But now I'll have to stall while you guys look there. Or you guys got it on the screen. Oh, we're good. Let us continue quickly. All right, I just want to read the first uh, eight verses uh, from Nehemiah. Thanks, guys, in the back. Um, l- let me just read the last half of uh, the, the verse from before. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. This is what God had told Moses at Mount Sinai in that first story. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him, on his right, and this will be fun, stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Masaiah, and on his left were Pedaiah, Mishael, Malkiljah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them, and as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peleiah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving meaning, giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Okay, so in this, in this scene, we have this remnant coming back to Jerusalem They have this ancient book of the law which has guided who they were as a people and they all gather and they read from it. Now when I see these three stories, in my mind I say, what was it necessary for them to gather? Like, God had this special relationship with Moses in the first story. He spoke to Moses and even in the story he says, Moses told the elders to tell the people to consecrate themselves and get ready to meet God at the mountain. Why couldn't he have just talked to Moses Moses, go tell the elders. Elders, go tell the people. Why do we have to have this big event where all the people come before this mountain to hear from God themselves? It's more efficient if one person hears it and then can just disseminate the information. We don't have to wait and gather everyone and go through whatever process this is to consecrate themselves. Or in that last example, it talks about Ezra reading the law, and then there's the Levites teaching the law to the people, like giving sermons, right, instructing them, helping them understand it. Why do they all have to sit there and listen to the law if this is implying that they didn't understand it, right? Why did they all have to gather and just listen? Why not just have a certain few people like Ezra or the priest really learn this stuff and then go meet in small groups and help everyone understand it? Then they'd be able to get the information. They they still want to know him. Why do they all have to be gathered, right? Or, Or with Jehoshaphat, right? It's not like all the people, all the people were in danger where this foreign army's coming, But all the people weren't in charge of the army, weren't weren't in charge of defense. That's the king. King, can you please talk to God? We're going to need his help. And then you let us know what to do. Why do we all have to gather? Why do we all have to come before God and pray? That's that's the questions that I want to ask. When all of Israel is gathering together for these events, wouldn't it be easier? Aren't there people specifically set apart by God to be the leaders? 
Moses, Ezra, Jehoshaphat, why don't we just let them do it and we'll just follow whatever they give because that's how we kind of fit in together. Now, I think that line of thinking is persistent today, right? I mean, there's pastors, there's theologians, there's authors, there's influencers, and they experience God, they learn, they study, and then they give it to us in bite-sized information, right? We read a book that shows how we can have a, a close relationship with God and we're content to say, you do the work and let me know what I'm supposed to do in order to experience it. It's not that I'm saying I don't want to do it, but you, you just do it and then let me have it. Or we watch sermons online or podcasts online, and, and we don't need to gather. I mean, there's, there's, like, what, what are we doing here on a Sunday morning that we can't just get on the side, on our own, in our own time? This is the question that we're going to answer by looking at these, these passages. Um, and I think if you're, if you're willing to hear it, you're going to see that there's a whole lot more insight than perhaps on a first glance uh, for why all of Israel was gathered and how it can relate to us. I'm going back to that first one, Exodus chapter 19. Because it gets really cool. I stopped at the cool part. Let's see, I think I got these slides up here. Um, I want to read what happened on that third day when they gathered before God. I'll read it off the screen. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. They're all gathered together, and this is what they see. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. So they had to get closer to all that after they're already trembling. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. Oops. The smoke billowed up from the smoke, uh, from it like smoke from a furnace. I almost stepped off. And the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. Mm. And then uh, we get the Ten Commandments. What, what comes from this powerful episode is the Ten Commandments are said before all the people. And then I think it's so telling. At the end of chapter 20, here's what the people's response was. Right Before, they're like, hey, yeah, we'll do everything that you say. Here's what the people say at the end. This is Exodus 20, 18 through 20. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, here's key, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. So why did all the people have to gather? According to Moses, the people acknowledge, hey, I don't want to have this close of a relationship with God. Seems like what you have with God is great. I would love this delegation bit. You hear from God. You pass it along to us. We'll follow. We have no problem with that. And Moses said, don't be afraid. This is for you to test you, right? So that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. What Moses is saying is we all needed to have this experience of God in order that we might be able to live righteously. I, he didn't doubt that they were genuine when they said, we will follow you, but we won't, he or God orchestrates this experience so that they would be shaped together by this experience with God. For us, we gather together to be shaped together. We want, just like the Israelites, we want to experience God in such a way that it directs us Right? Moses said that you, so you would not sin, right? so that they would walk forward in this law that they'd been given. They'd just been given the Ten Commandments. So they would be shaped by this experience so that they could live righteously. That's why we gather. We want to be like those people that experience God here on a Sunday morning and allow that to dictate how we live. I think of like when you go to the beach, you know, and we've got kids, and you bring little buckets and pails so that they can build things in the sand, like a giant sand castle. I feel like that's what we want to be to God, right? We want to be shaped by God. You know, not, um, not like little pieces of sand that are just kind of floating in the ocean. If we had a choice where we go, we, we would go to the beach where God is, and we'd say, I'm ready. Shape me. And that's what we're doing when we gather. We know that God shapes his people through shared experiences. Um, there's three of them that we're going to be going through today. Well, I guess two more that we're going to be going through today uh, in a little bit. But if we have the choice, we're going to choose to gather where God works to shape things for his glory, his sandcastles. 
and not just drift where we won't be shaped. Um, or there's no beaches around here, so perhaps that's a terrible analogy. Um, the other one that I thought of is like uh, the ice sculptures or those ice castles like up in Dillon. I've never been, but every year I've always got some of my friends on Facebook that are posting all these really cool pictures because these giant icicles make these, you know, it's like um, a frozen set. You know, where it's like everything, you know, you feel like Elsa's going to pop around the corner and start singing. Um, because it's so gorgeous from just this natural process. And if we're like a, a raindrop that gets to decide where am I going to go, and we say, well, I'm going to go to the mountains in Dillon because I want to be formed into this ice castle. It's like if we want to be formed by God, we want to be shaped by God, then we choose to gather in order that God would shape us. Uh, reading that second story gives us a little bit more uh, insight or another aspect to what it looks like to be shaped by God. Uh, let's jump there. Second uh, Chronicles 20. This one I think, yeah, they've got it in the back. It's wonderful. I want to read a little bit longer because I want, I want you guys to hear um, how the story goes. Uh, we'll pick it up in, in verse 4, uh, which is the last verse we read, and we'll read all the way down to verse 13. It's not the end of the story, but I, I can't just, I can't be like the Israelites and spend all day reading this thing. Maybe we could. You know, I shouldn't say that. I'll, I'll let you guys are available. <laughs> All right. Here it is. Second Chronicles 20, verse 4. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Remember, this is because the foreign army is invading. And Jehoshaphat just hears about it, and he brings everyone in. He, he declares a fast for all of Judah. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. So he's declaring in faith what they have already believed and been a part of um, as God's kingdom. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the inheritance, the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. I mean, the story doesn't end there. But do you see, what does Jehoshaphat pray for? When they're all gathered together, what is, what is he asking God to do? Nothing specifically. He just says, here's who you are. Here's our faith in you. Here's what you've done in the past. You told us to leave these nations alone, and now they're invading us. Help. <laughs> do, do something, right? Will you not judge them? And then there's an open hand. He, he, he willingly admits, we do not know what to do but our eyes are on you. He's showing a posture of one who is willing to be shaped, right? All of it, Judah and Jerusalem, they recognize the purpose that God has given to us. They gave, he, God gave us this land as our possession, and now this land as our possession is threatened to be taken away. Uh, we saw a little bit even with uh, Moses in the, in the previous chapter, in chapter 19, that they were supposed to be God's treasured possession, this kingdom of priests where all the nations could see what it looks like to live with God. And now that's all under threat. And so they say, help. They recognize this is an opportunity to be molded and to be shaped. And they say, we're, we're here for it. Help shape us. But they are not directing God. Uh, I want us to see it's not, um, the story isn't we got enough people together and now God's going to have to save us. You know, th that's not the reason why we gather. It wasn't so that our, our prayers would be more powerful. We'd have more ammunition to kind of twist God's arm to do the thing that we want, right? Because what, what's at stake here? Is it Jehoshaphat's reputation, uh, their wealth? I mean, sure, the people are, are, are threatened, like their standard of living, right? It'll drastically change if they get invaded. But that's not what they're praying about. They're not praying about their comfort, 
They aren't praying about uh, their ability to make money or, or have uh, a kingdom of themselves. They're saying, God, this is your plan that's under attack. Your purpose for us as a nation seems to be kind of in jeopardy here. What do you want? They are unified in their purpose of who they are as a nation, and they're bringing that before God, humbly letting him shape them. So as opposed to our prayers shaping God or trying to change him, or we don't gather together to get more firepower and help him you know, go our way, but rather we gather together and bring him things that are threatening our purpose and say, okay, Lord, what are you going to do? <laughs> How's this going to work out? Uh, you can read the rest of the story, see how it works out, but it's a happy ending. So you can read it to your kids at night. They won't be disappointed. All right, the next one, though, the next one. Nehemiah 1.8. Uh, if I wanted to go through the, the rest of the point, I would literally have to read the rest of chapter 8, 9, and 10. I'll leave that for you for homework, and I'll just give you the Cliff Notes version of this. What happens at the end of chapter 8, they read the law, they understand the law, and then they realize they're supposed to be celebrating a festival at that time. And that festival actually requires them to go do some things and build some things. And they say, okay, time out, stop. Stop reading. We're going to go do that. And they drop everything that they're doing. And they celebrate a festival for seven days all together in obedience to this law. Right after that, they spend time. This says uh, a quarter of the day in worship and a quarter of the day confessing their sins. Where they say, Lord, you are holy. We are not. We need you. We recognize the wrongs that we have done that, are, that the people in our past have done. Remember, these are the exiles coming back, the remnant that has rebuilt Jerusalem. And they say, we want to follow you. And then in chapter 10, it's this agreement, and it lists every single person who wrote their names down on the agreement that says, we agree we will follow everything that you declare. And what this story shows is that when they are all gathered together, hearing the, the, the law read to them, they're humble and willing, again, to be shaped in the moment, right then and there. No, uh, let me think about it. It's not disseminated to each one individually where they're making individual decisions. They say, as a group, we want to be shaped into a distinct culture that's different from anything else that we're seeing and distinct from what has come before us. We want you to shape us, and in humility, they get formed immediately. We see that as an example for us. If we go back to our analogy with the sand or the, the droplet of water, uh, when we go to the beach and our kids play in sand, they can only make sand castles where? Yeah, it's got to be at least close to the water. The tide has to be able to touch it because you need sticky sand. It, you, I mean, there's sand all the way back, right, when you're walking from the parking lot to the beach. And, you know, it's all hot and it's grainy. It's the stuff that gets, like, in the cars and the underwear and everything for days. Uh, that's very bad for making sand castles, right? You can put it in a bucket. That's just fine, but you flip it over and take it off and pfft, it all goes down. It's only the sand that is in the right place, the only sand that is moldable, shapeable willing to be moved. You know, we could say the same thing with the water analogy, right? We, we, could, we could choose to land in the mountains, in Dillon, and say, I want to be shaped. But then if we refuse to be frozen, then ah, I just want to be more flexible. You know, I, I got to make sure that I can go where I need to go. And we stay water, we will never be shaped into a nice castle. Similarly, we can choose to come to church out of obedience, out of a, a, a desire to encounter God, but if we don't have a heart that's willing to be shaped, we aren't going to ever be made into a sand castle or an ice castle. And I think, I think that's some of us. Are we coming, showing up ready to be changed like the people are here in Nehemiah? Ready to actually follow when God moves. Because if we're, if we're dry sand or if we're wet water, it doesn't matter how much God moves in our presence, how much he shows up, we aren't going to be formed. We aren't going to allow ourselves to be shaped together. All right, I want to address a counterpoint. So maybe you're thinking, great stories, and I'm sure there's more there. I'll look at it later when I get home. But these are all the Old Testament, Brad. The Old Testament before Jesus. Once Jesus comes, he changes it all. No longer do we have to have a, a group salvation where, where the only way we can know God is by joining together with all of God's people. Now we can know Jesus personally, right? We can have a personal relationship with Jesus in our life. So... Doesn't that allow us to have freedom to be disconnected, to be a piece of sand floating in the ocean, you know, a raindrop going wherever they want, because I can connect to Jesus on my own. He lives in my heart. I mean, this, this is all true. These are, this is logical arguments from the Bible. But here's the thing. 
you never see that written. There's a lot of the Bible written after Jesus too. But what, what happens when, when the disciples receive the Holy Spirit, this personal presence of God within their midst? They band together, they meet, they pray, they gather, they seek to learn who God is together. When Paul goes on his, his uh, missionary journeys, he takes three of them, and then he shares with them about who Jesus is, what does he leave behind? A bunch of individuals with lives changed? No. Gatherings, churches. And, and that's what the bulk of our New Testament are letters written to those churches, encouraging them, the, the gathering, the people that are coming together. And sure, maybe, maybe if you're, you're really skeptical, you might have a counter-counterpoint where you'd say, well, well, that's just because these are mainly from a Jewish background, and we already know the background from what we've read this morning is that we all gather together, and so they were just following, falling in line with their old traditions, and that's just what they did. And, and I'd say Paul has absolutely no problem writing against the traditions of their Jewish heritage when it needs to be corrected for Christianity. And yet you'd never see anything talked about, well, you shouldn't be meeting. You can do this on your own. Nowhere does he say that. He talks about how should you gather? How should you treat each other? Who belongs to the gathering? What does it look like? It's always assumed that we will be gathered together because we are still trying to be shaped together. Even in verse Peter, he echoes that passage we just read in Exodus that talks about we are a kingdom of priests. He uses the same language that us as a church, we're called to be shaped together just like they were in Exodus chapter 19. That's always been the, the goal of God, both pre-Jesus and post-Jesus. So we gather together to be shaped together. What does that look like for us then? For beyond church, how, how, how should this change our mindset? I've got three ways that I want us to think about it. First, being unified in purpose. Um, when we talk about we gather together, I think there's an elephant in the room that we need to address or an elephant not in the room, right? Look around you. Seriously, look, look around you. What are all those empty chairs doing, right? Like, how do you not notice that every time we gather together, right? All these empty chairs represent something different to each of us. For some of us, it's all of our friends who no longer attend church. The people that used to go here and now don't go here, right? For some of us, it's, it's people that uh, claim to be Christians but don't want to go to a church for whatever reason. Maybe they were burnt by church in the past, or maybe um, they, they just think that they can be this kind of floating piece of sand kind of Christian. That sounds terrible. Like a <laughs> little floating sand Christians. I didn't mean it like that. Um, but they feel like they can kind of do it on their own, and, and so therefore they don't go to church. Um, or it represents all the people that don't know Jesus, that, that don't even know who God is or what his love is, and would never have a desire to come here. But it's a barrier for us to be shaped together because when we see it, the thought can creep in our mind and say, ah, I wish we had more people here. Because if we did, then our worship would be more vibrant. God would hear our prayers more. You know, we'd, we'd, we'd be able to be shaped more. You know, like we'd have a little bit more momentum. You know, come on, you, you've thought this. We've all thought this. But, but, that thought has some, some major flaws. Because if we say that we can only be shaped or that we will only have vibrant Worship, if other people are here filling these seats, what we're essentially saying is, I need the approval of others to feel confident about what I'm doing, right? Because people vote with their feet. So if other people that aren't here at this church say, you're doing a good job, only then will I feel that what I'm doing is good or worth it. And, and that's something I think we've all got to address and set aside. See, if we're unified in purpose, then we say, I'm convinced that God has given us our purpose, Church in general, the purpose, to be witnesses of God, to, to make disciples of all nations. At Beyond Church, like Alex said, it's to live God's love beyond ourselves so all of Castle Rock will know his love. If we are convinced that is the purpose God has us here, then we can walk boldly and confidently and say, I want that. I want to be shaped into that purpose. And so, and so uh, that purpose will either be pr protected or redirected. And that needs to be our willingness every time we come. And, and so... Um, make sure we don't make excuses. Make sure we don't say, uh, we don't apologize to ourselves or to others. Oh, we, you know, when we get a little bit bigger. You know, God, God has given us a big auditorium. That's something that we can pray to him for, like Jehoshaphat, right? And say, well, here's the mission you've given us. Here's the tools we have. Here's the incongruence. Um, I'm, I don't know, but our eyes are on you. 
right? That's the prayer that he modeled. And so we give that to him, and then we can boldly and confidently go, well, here's the purpose he's given to us, and we will go, and we will gather together, unified in purpose. Another attitude adjustment has to do with meeting God together. This is what we're trying to do when we gather together. It's not just seeing songs, hear an inspirational word, like, like Moses at the mountain with all the Israelites. We want to encounter God and be shaped by an experience with him. So if you ever catch yourself uh, zoning out in worship, you don't know the lyrics, you aren't, you aren't able to connect, or I just keep droning on and on and on, and you're like, whoa, where are we? Remember, we're here to meet God. It's okay if you don't know the lyrics. It's okay if you didn't catch that last point or you spaced out. Pray, God, show me, show up, and help us encounter you this morning. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing uh, for, for everything, the prayer, the, the time that we're even spending together with each other. We want to encounter God, and that's why we gather together. Lastly, willing to be shaped, just like the people in, in Nehemiah, that we're ready and willing to be moved by God. If God does move, if there is an experience, we say, I'm not waiting. Right now, this afternoon, today, I'm changing. If God is moving me in a direction, we have to be willing to be shaped as a church. This takes prep work. This is on your way here. While you're walking in or during the first song, check your heart. <sighs> Lord, am I willing to be shaped by you today? That's our goal. Not again, again, again. Not just hearing good songs, being inspired, seeing our friends. Those are great things that are a part of what church is. But we meet, we gather together to be shaped together. If our rule, we gather together, our purpose is to live God's love beyond ourselves, so Castle Rock might know is uh, God's love. One of our rules was to invite others in. If we're disconnected and we're living on our own, we're, we're the, the floating sand Christian um, or the independent droplet Christians, I don't know, there's probably a better way of saying that. Uh, what are we inviting them into, right? If we want to share God's love, that's fine, but then we say, come join us. Join who? Oh, me on my journey here. It's only if we allow ourselves to be shaped into the community that God wants us to be, distinct from the world, distinct from other Christians, do we have something that we can invite them in. And if we hold on to those things that we talked about, we unified in purpose, I'm going to go backwards, unified in purpose, meeting God together, willing to be shaped with this attitude, it provides meaning, a reason for us to gather. When we lose this, maybe it's not necessary to go to church, but it is necessary if we want to be shaped together. And that's how we can invite people in and show them, be a part of this process that we're undergoing. And we actually have something that they can join in and do as we become a unique people shaped around him for his purpose. All right, we've got some questions that I'd love for you guys to continue the conversation with, whether it's at lunch today in community groups or just a quiet time between you and God. Uh, the first is an easy question. Uh, what gatherings with others do you cherish the most? So what, what, how do you interact or how do you enjoy meeting with other people and in what ways does that look like for you? Uh, secondly, how has God shaped you in community? Um, so think back to times where God has used community or, or shared experiences to really shape you and, and your life. Share that with other people as encouragement. And then lastly, how does your attitude need to change regarding gathering? Whether there's something that we brought up this ser uh, during this sermon or, or through reading your, your Bibles, uh, what does God want you to change about your posture, your attitude when we gather here on a Sunday? Uh, let's ask that God would apply this sermon uh, to our heart, this message, this encouragement to gather together in the ways that we need in our own hearts. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, uh, we thank you for your connection. We thank you for your love, for your desire to be with us. We thank you for your guidance and leadership of our church. Lord, I pray that you'd unify us around the purpose that you have for our church and either protect that purpose or redirect that purpose. We want to meet with you. We want to be shaped by you, Lord. Keep our hearts humble, willing to listen to you. And I pray that we would want to see you move, to obey, to fall in line. <laughs> and I pray that you'd just help this community thrive. I pray that it would be rich, that your love would just be so present here, 
that when people walk in, they can say, wow, something's different about you guys, but, but I like it. We want it to be you. We want this place just to have an aura, a smell of you, God. And we know that that happens when we gather together to be shaped together, to be made into your purpose. We thank you and we trust ourselves to you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.